right. Uh, I'm going to need somebody to look up Deuteronomy 30 uh, and have them ready to read. Okay. Uh, verses uh, 11 to 14 of Deuteronomy 30. If somebody could turn that up and just be ready to read it when we get to that point. Good evening, everyone. What we have up uh, on the screen right now is just the general outline of the epistle. Uh, we have spent uh, three weeks on this first section, two weeks on the second section. Uh, we're now into this third section, which we started last week. Uh, it's chapters 9, 10, and 11. It's discussing the gospel in relation to Israel. Uh, as we have been noting, uh, there's a certain puzzlement uh, about Romans. That is, it's written to non-Jews, but it keeps on acting as if there are Jews in the audience. Uh, so our suggestion is that it's designed to help the believers, uh, the Christians in Rome, uh, to teach Jews about the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace. And in this section here, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, this feature of the epistle is more intense. Uh, all three chapters are dealing with Jewish issues. Uh, what What is the role of the Jew as far as the gospel of Christ is concerned? They knew what their role was as far as the Old, Old Testament. They were the center point of the Old Testament. God was primarily dealing with them for close to 2,000 years. Now he's dealing with those who are called from all people. So the Jews under the gospel of Christ don't have any particularly a uh, uh, particular advantage or any particularly uh, uh, privileged spiritual position. And we, we find that in this section there's a uh, more concentration of direct quotes from the Old Testament and allusions to the Old Testament than anywhere else in the epistle, in fact, than anywhere else in the New Testament. And again, we are finding a lot of questions that are posed. There is at least 29 questions in this section that are expressed, uh, and a, a lot of them sound as if they are challenges that the uh, the Christians in, in Rome are going to have to face uh, when they are talking with uh, Jewish people who are asking about <coughs> their faith. Uh, and you'll recall that we suggested the uh, a, a likely objective of the epistle is to prepare the Gentile Christians in Rome to deal with Jews who were returning to Rome after having been expelled from Rome for several years. Uh, it, they apparently were expelled from Rome for a uh, six to seven year period. Uh, and now, uh, with the right wing of the uh, epistle of the Romans, they had just come back. So the uh, the Christian churches in Rome were not going to be faced with uh, Jews who were asking about the faith, uh, challenging the faith. And so we're, our suggestion is that uh, Paul is preparing uh, the Gentile believers to deal with these Jews uh, returning uh, uh, to Rome. Now there's, there's three major topics. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 of, of Romans uh, are not easy. Uh, they're, uh, they're a difficult read, so what we want to do is pick out three points that we want to stress tonight, rather than get too uh, bogged down in some detail. We'll cover a few details, uh, some very uh, interesting scripture challenges, actually, uh, but we want to stress uh, three points for sure. The importance of the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's obviously very important to the Apostle Paul, it's important that he proves all his points throughout the epistle with quotations and allusions from the Old Testament. Now, he uses the Old Testament to establish fundamental points, and he uses it to answer challenges to the gospel of salvation. Just as people of God. Now, Anybody, or most people, have a tendency to think that they're pretty quick. And it's not unusual at all uh, to attend a funeral and the person's life is reviewed and uh, the uh, person doing the eulogy, so we got all the good perks of the person and, 
And we like to think that, you know, we're, we're okay, and uh, when we die, uh, we'll be okay. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen to us. Well, the idea of I'm okay, you're okay, it, it may be useful as far as our getting along with other people, uh, but it's not God's way to salvation. Uh, because as we've seen in, in Romans chapter 118 to chapter 3, verse 20, uh, the apostle has pointed out that by God's standards, we are not okay. Uh, furthermore, a works basis of salvation honors man, not God. In other words, uh, we cannot work our way into eternal life by doing a lot of good deeds and accumulating them and, in effect, presenting them to God, saying, look how good I am, and, and you will give us that basis eternal life, that is not his basis. Now, mind you, that is the basis in Islam of reward by Allah, but it's not God's basis. Uh, and we have to deal with God's basis because he's the only one who can give eternal life. We can't do it. It'd be nice if we could, uh, but we can't do it. So we have to accept his basis, which is salvation is by grace through faith. It honors God, not us. Now, somebody has mentioned in the class, and this advantage of Skype, of course, is that we can't look each other in the eye. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, don't know you personally and individually. But somebody has brought up that uh, some because of their background have a uh, very negative view of themselves, um, which is normally uh, pretty bad uh, for, for an adjustment to the circumstances of daily life. But if that is a scriptural view, if that is based on scripture, that uh, I can see from scripture that I am a sinner who needs salvation, that is okay. And we may have a negative view of ourselves, and that actually may help us accept God's gracious forgiveness. It may not be helpful to be raised with a, uh, an attitude that, you know, you're great, uh, you're as good as anybody. Well, that may not be helpful to us accepting God's way of salvation. Uh, so we, have, we want to cover that point. We cannot establish our own righteousness before God. And thirdly, uh, we want to deal with the fact that the nation of Israel will be a blessed nation in the kingdom of God. Uh, we find that point being stated uh, clearly in Romans chapter 11. Uh, so first of all, the point of the importance of the Old Testament, you will recall, uh, uh, you saw this uh, over in last week. Uh, those are the more drunk illusions and read all the direct quotes uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, you can see, uh, without all those quotes, there wouldn't be a chapter 9. Uh, so Paul uses the Old Testament extensively. It's obviously very important. Uh, we reviewed this point that uh, explaining what an illusion is to the Old Testament, and uh, reviewed some of them, uh, and they uh, bring out the, the importance of the Old Testament and the importance of understanding uh, the Old Testament in connection with Israel. Uh, interestingly, the audience, uh, which was a primarily Gentile audience, was expected to be very familiar with the Old Testament. Now, of course, that's true. Uh, that was, would be true of the Jewish people. But it needed to be true of the, the non-Jewish Christians, uh, because that's the only writing, that's the only written Word of God they had available to them. The New Testament, we remember, did not exist yet. It was just being written. I mean, the Epistle to Romans, obviously, they didn't have it until it arrived in the mail or arrived uh, by a, a sister uh, bringing it to them. Uh, so, what they had was the Old Testament. The Gospels, some of them had been written, some of them hadn't. So, the New Testament had not been put together. Uh, for them to have in their hands like we do. So the written word they had was the Old Testament. So they needed to study it and be familiar with it. And we do too. Uh, Romans 10, we pointed out, similarly has 
all kinds of quotes from the Old Testament, and it demonstrates the importance of the Old Testament. Then we started on this, and I've expanded uh, this uh, slide, uh, this week, and so it's different from the one that uh, you would have had last week, so that's why uh, Ray had to reprint the notes. Sorry about that, Ray. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not selling paper, but for me, it seems that way. Um, what we find is that as we read uh, through Romans 10, we'll find Paul answering a number of issues in the Old Testament. And when we look at these issues, we can see that they are the type of thing that a Jewish person would bring up. Uh, in objection, objecting to or questioning the Christians about the Christian gospel. One of the things that we know was a question that the uh, Jewish people would raise is how can we be sure Jesus is the Messiah who God promised to provide? Now, now you remember that the three and a half years that the Lord Jesus was touring around in, in Palestine, and in Galilee and Judea and Samaria and Perea, um, the, the Jews ended up rejecting him as a nation. They crucified him. They would not accept the fact that he was the Messiah. And when he was crucified, now this acted as a, uh, a, big, a big negative. The Jews did not expect their Messiah to be crucified. They expected him to take a political role uh, and exalting himself as the ruler of Israel, throwing off the Roman yoke, and expanding Jewish power on a political and military basis in their part of the world. That did not happen. So a, a Jewish objection to Christianity was considering Jesus as the Messiah. So we know that was an objection and a question. Another issue was, did Jesus rise from the dead? You might remember that when the tomb was found empty, and when the soldiers who were supposed to be guarding it went back and told their leaders that there had been an earthquake and Jesus wasn't there, the uh, leaders told the soldiers to say that the disciples came and stole away the body. And that was a common uh, explanation of why the tomb was empty amongst the unbelieving Jews. So this was a, a problem, uh, an issue that the apostles had to overcome in talking to Jewish people, claiming Jesus rose from the dead. And they claimed they saw him. They claimed that more than 500 people at once saw him. And they, they could prove their word was true by the miracles that they performed. There's, a, there's another aspect to the preaching of the apostles that might not hit us uh, so clearly because we can the written word. We have the written New Testament. But what was being presented to the Jewish people was an oral testimony, a spoken witness. The gospel was not being presented to them in writing. Uh, because as we said, the New Testament did not yet exist. And the law, you'll remember, was written on tables of stone, and it was written in a book of the law, and when the various laws were given to Moses, he wrote them down. So law was in a written form. So they were being expected to believe something that was the an oral gospel. Now that, it's interesting that when we read, okay, now we're going to read a couple spots. Uh, first of all, Let's read Romans 10, uh, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. Now, they're up on the screen. So if somebody would read them from the screen, I'd appreciate that, if you would, please. <coughs> so, verses 6 through 9, is that right? Yeah, right here, they're right here. Okay. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring, Christ, bring up Christ again from the dead. God had already provided Jesus and has raised him from the dead. But what saith it? 
The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, which we preach, bringing it right to them. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is... You, you see, I got my comments. Yeah, next. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not there. Did you get that? This is no altar call. No, we see it. Okay. This is this is no altar call. Confessing Jesus risked persecution and took great courage. All right, I'm sorry. I got some of my own comments and brat in there. That's not in it's not in the Bible. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, somebody read Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 14. But this command which I command you today is not difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it? Nor is it beneath, beyond the sea that you should say, He will cross the sea for us to get it, to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. All right, now that's the passage that Paul is quoting and interpreting. Now the question is, why did he go there? He could have gone to the passage in Genesis. He wants to describe the righteousness which is of faith. And he could have gone to the passage in Genesis 15, which he had gone to earlier, which says, Abraham re believed God, and, and God counted it to Abraham righteousness. Or he could have gone to the passage in Haggai that he had quoted earlier, which says, the just shall live by faith. But he doesn't do that. He goes to this passage, which is rather obscure, uh, and brings out the interpretation that he does here in Romans. I would suggest the reason why he, do, he does this is because this passage brings together uh, various difficulties that the Jews were bringing up. It, it, it brings together the fact uh, that you have to accept that God has done what only God can do. Now, only God. You don't need to do it. You don't need to be looking around for it to happen again. It has happened. So that's the interpretation of don't try and get God's revelation from heaven or from the, from the depths of the sea, it's already here. Then this, this point about the, the, um, the gospel that you're going to be asked to believe is not in a written form. It's in an oral form. The word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. And Paul is saying, that's, that's what we're preaching. We're bringing... A message to you and that is to lodge in your heart and be something that you confess with your mouth. Now, this particular passage is cited by a lot of evangelicals and Pentecostals as what you do when you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Uh, that you, you believe He is Jesus, you believe He is your Savior, and you will say that and confess it openly. And that's it. That you're saved. Well, that's not what's going on in the first century in this context. It's not what happens today in uh, a lot of countries in the world. Where if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, and that's your belief, you can be put in jail. And if you are converting from Islam, to Christianity and make that confession, you can be uh, charged with treason and can be executed. Uh, so, we, we're not talking here about something that is trivial or easy. Uh, it's one thing to confess with your mouth in our context, in our situation, 
It's totally different, and it was totally different in the first century, and it is totally different in a lot of places in the world today. So if we really believe that Jesus is the Lord and is our Lord, then we are prepared to open speak about him, declare him, then we are talking about true conversion of whole person, their heart, their mind, and their way of life. But the the, the thing that I, I find quite a challenge is I Paul went to that particular passage and I, I just suggested to you a, a reason why. Uh, now we talked about this second challenge uh, last week. Uh, how can you prove that Jew and Gentile are, are, Gentile are on an equal footing before God through faith? Well, the answer is taken from a couple of passages in the Old Testament, Isaiah 28 and Joel 2, and the emphasis is on the word whosoever. Uh, and the answer to any objection the Jews will raise is right there in their own scripture. Their own scripture is saying there's going to come a time when it's whosoever believes on him will not be ashamed that God's uh, method of faith, of saving by faith, is going to be open to everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, then there are some, okay, this thing is so touchy, it changes what I don't want to do now, it's getting difficult. Okay, here we go. Uh, there's a, a rather odd uh, statement that's made in verses 14 and 15. Um, you, so, let's see if I got any of my own stuff in there. I guess I do. Uh, let, me, let me just read these verses. Uh, How then shall they call on him, him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall <laughs> they How shall I? Well, I thought. Yeah, right. How are you doing? Nope. 